Yeah, George was on a family trip in 1959 from New Mexico to Oregon that included a stopover in Durango, Colorado. Um, <clears throat> George's brother, Matt, figured out the DNRGW in Durango was narrow gauge. And when they got back, as Matt went about acquiring catalogs from various model manufacturers of narrow gauge items. In the early 1960s, the brothers obtained a copy of narrow gauge in the Rockies and George was taken by the CNS, particularly the bogies. HON3 modeling was started in the late 1960s, but in 1969, George saw an ON3 bogey at a hobby shop in Glendora, California. And at the same time, Coronado Scale Models had put out a kit for a DSPNP boxcar in ON3. So the die was cast and George moved from HON3 to ON3. Under the name South Park Line, George produced a number of DSPNP and CNS kits in quarter inch scale, including the Alpine Tunnel Engine House. George was a longtime member of the East Bay Miniature Environmentalists, ON3, ON2 Club in Oakland, and he wrote the text for the narrow gauge pictorial volume six, Motive Power of the Colorado and Southern. He spent eight years working for Grant Line. He spent five years as an associate editor at the Model Railroader magazine and 15 years teaching English and theater at Tunexas Community College. More recently, George authored a 24 part series on his build of DSPNP 280 number 191 from a sidetrack models brass C16 kit. He published this series on two groups IO, the ON3 list and the DSPNP list. And at this point, George has got about 15 years into his most recent DSPNP CNS layout and quarter inch scale featuring the Alpine Tunnel. So that's George's subject tonight. And uh, this is, this is going to be a great clinic. Thank you, Dave. Um, OK, I'm going to share my screen and begin the program. OK, so the Alpine Tunnel. Um, Operated from 1882 to 1910 on the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad, and obviously up, up through the Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison, and then the Colorado and Southern. Um, this lead photo is a photo I shot inside the tunnel um, in 1980. Um, at that time, you could still get inside the tunnel, and uh, I actually entered it twice, um, once very briefly, and the other time uh, going as far as one could from. Uh, from the West Portal. Uh, the tunnel was begun in 1880 um, and it was dug from both the East and West portals. Um, and they, the, the tunneling breached in, in July 26th of 81. Uh, and the first train went through in uh, roughly a year later, July 19th, 1882. It was the first tunnel under the Continental Divide. And at the time it was the highest. Uh, the West Portal is at 11,521 feet, and there, there is an apex inside the tunnel at 11,523, and the East Portal is 11,496. It's 1,171.7 feet long. Uh, it had, of course, like, like all of the narrow gauge railroads, uh, it was periodically closed uh, weeks at a time, month at a time, uh, due to snow. Uh, in the early years. And uh, then in 1888, um, there was a rock fall and the management decided to close it. Um, and then when, uh, when the DLNG went into receivership, um, uh, the decision was made to reopen it in 1894 and it operated then until 1910. So just a quick look, this, uh, this map is actually from the, the narrow gauge pictorial, uh, narrow gauge uh, in the Rockies. Um, th just a reminder that, that sort of how we got to the Alpine Tunnel. Um, the Rio Grande, of course, had built south. It was headed for Mexico City. Um, and, and then the Leadville fields in particular had developed. Uh, so it hung a right uh, to head up the um, uh, Arkansas River Valley. South Park had headed west to start with. Um, its goal had always been the gold fields and then obviously like its name, the idea that it could make a transcontinental connection. Um, so it went west out through uh, the Platte Canyon uh, and then the South Park itself uh, and down to um, 
Schwander's where it met up the Arkansas River Valley and up to Buena Vista. The two railroads met there in 1880. Um, and uh, at that point, Jay Gould had taken uh, monetary control, at least shares uh, control over both railroads and created the joint operating group uh, agreement. Uh, the Rio Grande would build north uh, from Buena Vista to Leadville and the DSPNP would head west to Gunnison and they would share trackage rights over the two lines. Um, Leadville obviously had all of the, the mining uh, Gunnison had, had mining along the way, but also most importantly for the South Park right to the end was the coal fields, uh, uh, which were located north of Gunnison. Uh, and of course, it was also the gateway to both the Pacific uh, and Southwest Colorado where the mining was also developing. Uh, this is a picture uh, just north of Buena Vista that actually shows a, this is a Rio Grande train up front. Um, and a South Park train in the background, the Congdon stack is the giveaway there. Um, not the greatest quality photo, um, but uh, just uh, this was the idea they did operate um, and for several years uh, did so. Um, Glenn Brewer's uh, railroad uh, Facebook page of Railroad Glory Days uh, periodically posts photos of the Alpine Tunnel and whenever he does, uh, notes that it was ill-conceived, ill-planned, and ill-fated. Um, and I tend to disagree with the first two, though I understand why it's it's used. Um, the the ill-conceived and the ill-planned tends to go on two arguments. The first argument was that they chose the wrong pass to go over to start with. Um, the DSPNP did look at Marshall Pass uh, as, as a route towards Gunnison. Um, Mears operated a toll road on it, and the management was told that it would require 8% grades um, to go over it. Whether that was a deliberate misleading on the part of Mears uh, and possibly the Rio Grande, or whether in fact it was simply um, a misconception, uh, they decided to look elsewhere. Um, and so they went up uh, Chalk Creek uh, to go over Alpine Pass. That decision uh, produces the second argument that they should have located on the other side. Um, as you can see from this, this uh, relatively crude map from Buena Vista, uh, and again, this is the connection going north to Leadville. Um, and then it came out, entered, entered Chalk Creek Canyon um, and worked its way up to St. Elmo, um, and it all, here it is on a north facing slope. Um, however, it's still relatively low elevation through this area. Um, and this was never a particular um, problem for snow, et cetera, even though it was on the north facing slope. The, the line from Romley to, from St. Elmo to Hancock was on a west facing slope, which should have been fairly good, but of course it was climbing uh, significantly higher. Snow, snow was an issue along here and particularly between Hancock and the tunnel. Um, in 1890, the, rather famously, the snowplow trials between the Joel plow and, and the rotary were conducted along that stretch of track uh, with the, the rotary being the ultimate victor. The argument is, some, is occasionally made that they should have gone up on the other slope, either right from the start heading up here um, and crossing over uh, at this point and coming up the other side. Uh, and this is a little more detailed view. Um, you can see you're coming up to Hancock um, and then this is the north facing slope. And the idea that you could have come up here uh, and entered the pass from the other side. This is a, a uh, Google Earth view. Um, this is the line coming up from St. Elmo uh, and, and Romley. This is Hancock and it curves, sawmill curve and comes up. Uh, and again, this is that north sloping face up to, and here is the east portal. You'll note that the tunnel itself is, it runs almost north south, uh, although we refer to the east portal and west portal. If we shift our view slightly so that we're looking a little farther, we can see that um, if we were to try to cross from um, this line of the road to the other side up here, it would have required a, a phenomenal trestle. Um, you could potentially have crossed earlier. 
However, this is the side that had the major mine producers, particularly the Mary Murphy, which would produce uh, and continue to ship long after the railroad itself had closed. And even had it come up here, it would have had to presumably come up and come back uh, and get to the tunnel. And you really still would have been in the same snow conditions. So the argument that you might have done something else is a little, a little misleading. Um, going back to the other photo, just there was a consideration actually after even the original tunnel was built, uh, but even at the time to make a lower elevation tunnel uh, that would have gone perhaps straight through here or maybe even over here. Um, it would have been a much longer tunnel. Uh, and again, as it was, the tunnel was, was considered quite the engineering feat. Uh, so that was a unlikely choice. Um, fate, however, did hold a hand. Um, the explosion of the volcano Krakatoa in, in 1883 produced throughout the world four years of unusually cold weather, um, and including the, the worst of it in 87, 88, uh, included powerful blizzards and record snowfalls worldwide. Uh, Krakatoa was certainly a contributor. It may not have been the only contributor, uh, but it was an important contributor to this. And that was during the period, of course, when much of the closures were happening and leading up to the snowplow trials. Um, this is a cross-section of the Alpine Tunnel. This is from Dow Helmer's book, The Alpine Tunnel, um, out of print, but still largely available uh, on eBay and such places and bookstores. Um, you can see the, the, this is the east portal on this side, climbing to the apex and out. Um, also in the fate category, of course, this design meant that smoke tended to get trapped in here. Um, in the attempt to reopen the tunnel in 1894, um, Dad Martinez was the engineer of, a, of an engine in the tunnel um, and was overcome and in fact passed away because of the, uh, they, they backed the engine out hoping to be in time, but he, he succumbed anyway. Um, so there were always these issues. Um, the, the east portal of the tunnel is, is, enters on a 24 degree curve. Um, and, and, and then straightens out. The, the headings when they breached uh, were only a quarter inch off, which was pretty impressive uh, civil engineering um, and, and worthy of note. This is a cross section of the tunnel timbering. Uh, this was all done with 12 inch by 12 inch um, redwood timbers. Uh, they specifically ordered what were called butts and sinkers. Uh, which was redwood that was dense enough that it didn't float. Um, none of the cave-in in the tunnel is due to the, the, the timbered section. It's all in the, the, the bare rock section. They had expected to do uh, most of the tunnel as, as hard rock uh, construction. As it turned out, almost all of it had to be timbered. Um, of interest, besides the, the general design, uh, the ties are kept aligned in the tunnel because obviously you don't want them creeping to one side or the other. It's tight enough as it is uh, with spacers uh, between the, the bottom sill piece and the ties. Again, this is one of my photos. You can see the, this is the rail going this way. Um, and here are the spacers uh, holding those ties in place so that they stay centered within the tunnel. Of interest, uh, this is a joint between uh, two of the beams. These are the vertical beams on the lower walls and these are the arch sections. And you can see this uh, notched joint where the two pieces overlap. Um, obviously it's supported below right next to each other. Um, interestingly, the one of the arch uh, timbers is sitting right on uh, the joint. This is a view near the entrance from the west portal. Um, there's a section of timbered and then, then hard, hard rock. Um, you can see it's, it's caved in, but you can walk over it. And then the timbering starts again in the distance. <coughs> That's yours truly, uh, a much younger version. Um, this is right at the entrance uh, to the tunnel. Uh, the tunnel was filled at the entrance almost to the top of the the arch and you kind of wedged yourself through this very small hole um, and slid down this 
quite steep slope. Um, it is water from here to here about 12 to 15 inches deep, quite cold. Um, uh, and then once you get across that rock fall, the rest of the tunnel was dry. This is looking back towards the entrance um, and you can see the entrance up there. It actually looks quite large because of the glare of the light, but it's the, the actual entrance is right in there. Um, but that is the slope. You can see the, the spring of the arch of the timbers uh, quite clearly. This is the East Portal. Um, snow sheds were added and removed and, and added uh, periodically through it. This shot was taken uh, sometime after the reopening. Um, it's interesting in part because it's an action shot. You can see from the, uh, the track in front that we are actually in motion when this, this uh, picture was taken. Um, this is the East Portal in 2006. You can see that there still is um, timbering from the snow sheds uh, there. You can walk up. It's collapsed even more now than it was in 1980. In 1980, you could still kind of look in and there was sort of a, um, a caverny area uh, of the interior that was visible, though only for maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 feet. These are the facilities of Alpine Tunnel Station as built. This is on the West Portal. Um, you can see a snow shed here. The actual exit of the tunnel is down over here. Um, and, uh, and this is at the time, not a track. It was used as a part of the construction and was simply a dump for material taken out of the tunnel. It would later, uh, after the engine house burned, be used as the lead and they built a new turntable at the end of that. Um, this is the engine house, uh, stone uh, section house, and the little telegraph shed. And you can see that it's entirely covered um, with snow sheds. This is a close up from that same picture. Uh, and again, you can see that the entire building is, is surrounded by these snow sheds. This is a view from the other direction. Um, this is over the, the turnout uh, for the switch stand. Uh, that led to the, the engine house. Um, the, the engine house, these timbers for the, for the um, snow shed are, were actually embedded into the front wall of the, um, of the engine house. You can see that there's an arch here and you can just see it in this picture that the snow shed actually goes up and over um, what the opening we'll see in the next shot. Wow. Oh. Not quite, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so the question of why did they build these things? And the fact is they built identical facilities or nearly identical facilities at all of their major passes, Alpine, uh, Boreas, which was the first pass going over from Como to Breckenridge and then over Fremont Pass into Leadville itself. Um, all of these had similar engine houses. The Fremont one was wooden, both Alpine and Boreas were stone. Um, the engine houses contained coal, water, and a turntable. They were probably intended as helper stations. Um, it was a pattern used by the Pennsylvania Railroad and others in the east. Um, engines dropped down to assist trains up. Uh, and then the idea was, of course, stationed at the top, they could drop down to either side as needed. Um, However, that purpose probably disappeared uh, around a, the winter of 1883-84 uh, when the South Park converted to automatic air brakes. Um, and it did that over that winter, the entire railroad. Um, and once it did, operations began using helpers up and down uh, because the extra engines were useful for uh, providing extra air for the braking as well as the extra power for going uphill. Um, in any case, the need for um, uh, loco servicing at the tops of the hill of the grades, uh, water and coal, uh, and, for, and for section houses for maintaining uh, the track in those areas remained. Um, this is a view of the engine house um, at the reopening or close to in 1894. Uh, you'll note some changes. They've removed almost all of the skylights, um, an interesting choice since, in fact, you you kind of need light in there, but they did. 
Um, and you can see that there's this, this hole up here. Um, and that's the one that the snow shed went up and over. These little black dots are, are the beams that originally supported the snow sheds and they've just been sawn off. Um, this little dot here um, looks to me, always looked to me like it fit right in there. And it looks to me like there are some, some hands, clock hands there. Uh, my theory is that they were in fact repairing it and would reinstall it. Uh, I never convinced Dave Grant of that. He was pretty sure this was just a defect in the negative and that may be the case. Uh, but when I did the kit for the engine house, um, I, I opted for the clock. Uh, in 1906, all of the engine houses burned, uh, which was probably an interesting case for the insurance companies. Um, you can see that after, in immediate aftermath of the fire, um, the end walls were still standing. Uh, the railroad presumably knocked them down. At this point, the, the stone section house had already fallen into disuse. You can see that the roof is caved in, but that had happened before, uh, before the engine house was, was um, burned. And there is, uh, tales that inside, uh, not tales, uh, memoirs, et cetera, from, from people who worked there, um, that they had built inside the engine house um, a, a bunk area, presumably enclosed, that, that served as the section house uh, after this one had fallen into disuse. Um, and you can see, obviously, there's a work train here um, working on the engine house. After when, when they did the reopening in 1894 and after the fire, they built this new wooden section house next to the telegraph house. Um, they installed the turntable up off that um, trackage I showed you before, as well as a, a another water tank farther up uh, closer to that, that turn off for the, the turnout. This is an interior wall of the, the section house. And it's interesting in part because these are um, sort of two by, I think two by four might have been two by six or, or more um, beams or pieces of wood that are embedded into the stone walls. And they had sheathing, uh, vertical sheathing that was nailed to those um, that provided a, a, a little more airtight uh, and a little more comfortable room for uh, within the section house. You can see the, um, the uh, coal dock here in the distance. Um, this is the, the most, uh, most complete wall left of the engine house. This is right on the other side of this wall is where the water tank was. Uh, you can see the telegraph office and the collapsed section house here. Um, when I was there, this section house, you could still, the front wall was still fairly intact uh, by the, in 1980. Um, by the time Ray Rossman with the Forest Service really started to preserve things in there, um, it had pretty much completely fallen apart. The tank was already missing here. Um, the stone walls that supported it were there. Um, Ray was pretty sure he knew where it was. Somebody had come and picked it up and hauled it off for use as a hot tub somewhere. Um, Again, operations continued until 1910, and this would this shop would have been close to close to that end. Uh, you can see that this is a train full of coal, and that was the primary west uh, eastbound loads. Um, there was some agricultural product, probably some manufacturing product out of Gunnison that went east, uh, but relatively little. Mostly, it was it was all coal. Um, and, and therefore uh, empty guns headed back, um, and, and, but also supplies uh, being shipped to Gunnison as, as well as the mines. Once through the tunnel and heading eastbound down through Chalk Creek, there were lots of mines, particularly the Mary Murphy, that also shipped out significant quantities uh, of, of ore and that. And again, you can see that this is multiple engine. I'm pretty sure there's a fourth engine back on this particular train. Um, as Dave said, I've been modeling this um, really since about 1970. Um, I had started, when I worked for MR, I had started a layout quite similar to the one I, I'm working on now. Um, and obviously 
when I moved here in 2000. Uh, it took me a few years to get started, but uh, it went on. I produced the kit uh, starting in about 1980, first when I was living in Colorado, uh, and then I did a second run while working for Grantline. Um, the, the walls are, are cast plaster walls. Um, Bill Gould uh, did the original patterns for windows and that for me. Um, I have carted this particular engine house around with me since 1980. It has traveled all over the country. Um, uh, and, and I model it, as you can see, with a single track here as originally built uh, in 1894. They had double tracked it out front. This is the other end. Um, and obviously the stone section house. I didn't have the depth to, to get the, the L extension on the end here. Uh, but went with uh, just the, the basic depth of it. Um, so, uh, and this obviously is the telegraph office. This is an interior shot of the model. Um, the, the model trusses were based on a design that Cray and Bell did for their plans that appeared in the, I think it was actually in, in Slim Gauge News. Uh, before before it became part of the Gazette. Um, and this obviously is a coal dock. Um, there's the tank. Uh, it sits on a stone, stone walls uh, with supporting beams. Um, I added a couple of locomotive headlights based on a photo that appeared in, that's uh, 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 of Como, of the Como roundhouse that has a couple of headlights uh, hung out there. Um, for lighting the turntable. Uh, my theory was that I could use that for helping to spot where engines were on mine. Visibility is such that I really probably would have to install a camera inside to really see it. Um, clearances are really tight. Uh, the engine house is only 53 feet inside. It's a 50 foot turntable. Um, Mason bogies, two six O's fit on it pretty comfortably. Two eight O's should, but most model two eight O's have enough gap uh, between the uh, tender and, and, and cab uh, to make it pretty problematic turning them around. This is my uh, rendition of the, of the uh, tunnel itself. Um, and uh, you can see you, even for just a little bit of it, you go through quite a bit of wood. This is a telegraph line coming in. Uh, the telegraph ran through the tunnel after it was built. Uh, it had originally been strung over the top of the pass, um, but uh, then was moved inside for greater security. And no trip to the tunnel is complete without uh, the, the Palisades headed up to the, uh, the West Portal. Um, and this is my rendition of them. Uh, sadly, uh, there was a, um, a rock fall a couple of years ago uh, that took out this section of the wall. Um, and so you can no longer drive up to the, to the West Portal. You can park at Woodstock Loop and walk up. Um, and, and that, however, that funding has been um, secured uh, and, and engineering plans are being developed to rebuild the wall, which is really wonderful because it seemed, and, and rebuild it as it should be with, with stone. Um, And that is a Pullman. Um, this is a Pullman headed down downgrade. Um, this would have been the overnight from Denver to Gunnison. And uh, you can see the, the, the Pullman car there at the rear. Uh, this operated uh, for most of the, the 1880s into the early 90s as a Pullman service. Um, and it's always been one of my favorite shots. Okay. That is my presentation. Say, I have a question. Uh, how long did it take to get through the tunnel and what speeds do they uh, go at? Um, probably around five miles an hour. Um, uh, probably not much more than that. Uh, they tried to um, minimize, obviously, uh, you had no choice. You were going up grade one, either direction. Uh, but you were trying to minimize it. The, the stories from the engineers at the time was that they, they kept a bucket of water in the cab and they dunked their handkerchiefs in the bucket of water and put it over their noses. 
um, kept low in the cab <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and sort of prayed. Um, but it would not have been high speed. Uh, the um, going up those grades, there, there are, there's film of the CNS going up uh, Clear Creek Canyon um, and it's going up walking speed. You know, I mean, you swear you could climb off and, wow. and do. Um, I mean, the schedule itself, if you look at the, the timetable, um, the passenger trains were scheduled to look like they ran probably around um, 20 miles an hour. Um, so obviously elsewhere, um, they could pick up some speed, maybe only 15 miles an hour average. Um, but, uh, but through the tunnel itself, I'm sure it was slow. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, George. Uh, really interesting. And those South Park locomotives are very, very interesting. Mm. And uh, there's a number of them on uh, eBay right now, actually, um, for those of us in SN3.